Ladies and gentlemen, kicking off the first stop on his world tour, our new president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson! You say you want some revelation, well here you go. It's gonna blow your freaking mind. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the weekly Mormon News Roundup, where D-Days and Randy Bell are going to ruminate on the great and spacious beehive. Uh, today is April 30th, 2023. This is episode 57, where Randy Bell, he's going to co-host. Let's talk about the Lori Vallow trial updates and daily Mormon news brought to us by artificial intelligence and a $2 billion Mormon sex abuse judgment. Now, if you want to get in touch with us, we're at uh, www.mormonnewsroundup.org. Or you can send us an email to colob at mormonnewsroundup.org. You can also send us a voicemail if you come on over to Spotify. We're on Twitter at at NewsMormon. We're on YouTube. And oh, I also have another channel that's called the Mormon Movie Reviews. If you'd like to subscribe or uh, support this podcast, then make a donation over to Patreon. And I would really like to thank our new patrons this week. We have uh, four folks that I am very grateful for. Uh, number one, I'd like to thank Mark. Number two, I'd like to thank Wendy. Number three, I'd like to thank Michael. And number four, I'd like to thank Fox Boy. Now, if you could give us a thumbs up, if you could subscribe to this channel or leave us a five-star rating, we'd be very grateful for your support. Uh, Randy Bell, welcome to the Mormon News Roundup. Hey, thanks. It's great to be here. Hey, uh, it's, it's a very it's a pleasure meeting you. Um, you know, you're the first person that I've had on this podcast um, who's had their own Wikipedia page here. Uh, you're a socioeconomist, a, a real estate economist, and an appraiser, and an expert witness, and an author based in Los Angeles, California, known known for dealing with stigmatized property. So uh, you've earned the nickname here, Randy, as the master of disaster. Uh, how did you obtain that nickname, and how do you feel about it? Well, I got that name from the LA Times. They came out with an article. I think the lead in line was Randall Bell is the master disaster. At first, I was kind of annoyed by it. And then I thought, you know what? Just go with it. I got a master disaster hat. I, when I give speeches, I give them out to the kids in high school and that kind of thing. But that's what I do is I study disasters. I was just on a plane yesterday uh, going to big disasters. And I studied the economic effects. And the court system doesn't award hugs or kudos or uh apologies the court system awards dollars and somebody needs to compute those dollars and that's what i do now you're also an author you've written a number of books here um on uh, personal resilience on uh, thriving after uh, religion on strategy 10 steps to uh, uh creating a, a game plan for business and life you know how does a sociologist and um someone who's involved with real estate how did you get involved with uh, writing books I'm eclectic. I got a lot of thoughts going on. I wrote a book on Leo Fender that I mentioned the electric guitar. I wrote a textbook, which has uh, gone huge. It's in its third edition. I wrote a book, Me, We, Do, Be, which is on kind of personal game plans. And uh, the book I have out now is Post-Traumatic Thriving. It's, it's recovery from trauma. None of my books discuss Mormonism at all, not this a single word. I, I kind of keep things... Uh, you know, separated between my work, my personal interests with the book writing and my personal life. But um, yeah, it's just, I'm on the plane a lot. And so rather than watching the inbound flights or the, the inboard flights, whatever they're called, I just sit with a laptop and write books. Well, that's great. You also appeared on uh, Mormonism, uh, you know, on Mormon Stories. I believe it was last year, right? And you gave your Mormon story. What has been the reaction to you appearing? You know, you said you wanted to keep your work life and your personal life separate, but you seem to, um, that seems to be in contrast to what you did on Mormon Stories. What? Why did you go on there? What has been the reaction to your episode? Well, the, the reaction has been incredible. I, what's been amazing to me is that people I've known for decades have emailed me and said, hey, I'm with you. You know, I've, I go to church, but I'm with you 100 percent or a lot. And a lot of people I had no idea have, have left the church that I've known over the years. Um, pretty, you know, very, very positive. Uh, John had asked me to be on on his podcast for years, and I kept saying, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I was still, you know, honestly processing this stuff. And then, I, and then what really kind of triggered me, if you will, to uh, going on the podcast and being a little more vocal was the Boy Scout thing. You know, I'm an Eagle Scout. My three sons are Eagle Scouts. And when I saw the Boy Scout, uh, you know, organization go down in flames with this child molestation stuff, and then, of course, the church is tied to it, I took my Eagle Scout plaque off the wall and threw it in the trash. I, I just don't tolerate that stuff. And and I think responsible adults, when they when, when we get into that realm, it's time to speak up. 
Now you you just didn't uh, stop with Mormon stories as well. You kind of do the um, really the LDS uh, podcasting circuit here. Um, you you appeared uh, recently on an episode a few months ago of uh, Mormonism Live, where you talked about uh, Joseph Smith and um, his secret education and the Dartmouth connection. Why are you continuing to stay in? You know, it's one thing to go on Mormon stories, give your story, so that you know you let people know where you stand. Why are you continuing to go into the LDS related podcasting circuit? What draws you to the space? Well, it, it, to me, honestly, at this point, it's it's a mix between uh, addressing these issues in terms of my own journey, and it's also entertaining. At, at this point, the Mormon Church is just vastly entertaining. It just keeps producing more and more information that that is just like, wow. So I I don't know. I just yeah, I think when again when when and there's trauma molestation allegations and, and admitted problems. It's time to speak up. And uh, coupled with that, the other peripheral issues of Mormonism are entertaining. Um, I think I need. To, I think it needs to just be talked about, and I'm willing to do it at this point. Well, uh, thank you so much uh, for agreeing to come on our uh, humble podcast here. We really appreciate that. Now, um, is there anything else about your personal life or religious beliefs that you'd like to share with us uh, before we hop into the uh, weekly Mormon news? Because that's really what this podcast is all about. Well, I guess I just say I'm an open book. I I uh, left Mormonism in a single day. I was sitting there on my laptop. I came across the gospel topic essays. I saw where Joseph Smith lied about polygamy. That was a lie that was covered up in my entire experience. And it's like that those are not my values. I'm out. And um, and so I went on a, a journey. I kind of did my best to you know put my bias aside and wipe the slate clean. I went to uh, Jerusalem and talked to, you know, the Jewish folks there. And I went to Egypt and, and Istanbul and talked to Muslim people. I went to India and talked to lots of Hindus and Buddhists. And I called up a lot of my uh, Christian friends and said, Hey, I know we've been bashing for years. Let's talk. So I'm on a quest of trying to figure things out uh, like anyone else. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a born again Christian or evangelical Christian, but I do. I still like Jesus. Um, not so not so big on Joseph Smith. Yeah, I got you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate you coming on. Now, we always have our Mormon News Roundup joke of the week here. And I found this. This was just published just a couple of days ago, Randy. And um, this is a little bit of a uh, maybe it's taking a little bit of a shot at you. Um, but it is. A, I guess it's supposed to be a funny here. There's a picture of you hanging out with. Uh, there you are on the right. That's you, Randy. <laughs> uh, you're hanging out here with, uh, uh, there you are, you're on the motorcycle, you're with John DeLynn, you're with RFM, you're with Lindsay Hansen Park, you're with the whole crew here of uh, Bill Real and all of them, and you're going to some kind of a Western... Um, some kind of a Western cafe here and you're, you're throwing darts, you're drinking beer, you're having a good time. Um, now this, I guess this is supposed to all be in good fun, but I guess they're lumping you in. This is a website. Uh, these, this YouTube guys, they, they, they are anti-Mormon. They're trying to put out videos against anti-Mormons. Do you consider yourself to be an anti-Mormon Randy? Well, th first of all, this is hilarious, and I consider it a great compliment to be uh, numbered with with John DeLynn, who is a great, ethical, good person, as is RFM. I've spent a lot of time with RFM. I was just in Bill Reel's house. Uh, these guys tell the truth. It may be inconvenient. It may make people uncomfortable, but uh, so far, I... Uh, I, I've seen nothing but truth and ethics, and, and they admit their mistakes when they make them. I make mistakes. We all make mistakes. So, A, I, I'm complimented to be part of the uh, biker gang with those guys. Um, Anti-Mormon, I, I, I don't know that that's a term I would use. I know the church is very fond of labeling people. Um, I'm, a, I'm critical, um, but, you know, I'm a critical thinker. Uh, I went to grad school for that. So... Yeah, I'll I'll take that. Um, and but but I'm also a nice guy. If the church does something great, I'm the first to be excited about it. I got friends and family still in the church, and I want it to be a good, safe organization. And I think by turning on the lights and illuminating what's going on, uh, forces the church to step it up. Uh, you know, protect children better. I'm also I I wish Sam Young was in that biker gang too, because Sam's one. <laughs> I just got back from a trip with to. Uh, Mount Everest with him. Um, so these are wonderful people, and I'm I'm proud to be uh, whatever you want to label me. I I'm uh, I'm good with it. 
Yeah, well, I, I guess it's supposed to be in good fun. I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's a happy Easter message. It's rather silly. Um, I just thought that's our Mormon joke of the week. Um, I definitely don't take that YouTube site very seriously because it, it, they edit out the faces. They put uh, the faces of the people in there. I'm not exactly sure exactly what they're trying to accomplish, but uh, I'm glad that you <laughs> took it in. Uh, I, mean, it, it, I think it's in good fun. You know? um, yeah. Now, our, our, our next article here, um, just real, real briefly, when we get into our articles here, um, is that there is a couple of places that you can get your weekly Mormon news, obviously. You can get it from KSL. You can get it from the church news sources itself. You can get it from the Deseret News. And there's also a number of podcasts as well where you can get it. And there's also um, Mormon News Weekly, which uh, John DeLynn uh, started with uh, Jana Reese and uh, Patrick Mason. They started that, and uh, they only released a couple of episodes. They took them all down. And um, I, I just wanted to make that. That's that's news for me because I thought that they were going to be a big kingpin in the area of Mormon uh, Weekly News. And I guess I'm, I'm making a small joke here that we have learned by sad experience that it is the nature and disposition of almost all podcasts that they fizzle out soon after they're starting. Hence, I think this is in the Doctrine and Covenants. Many are called, but few go viral. Now, I uh, just want to play the Midnight Mormons as soon as, you know, if you're familiar with Cardinalis, uh, Kwaku, and yeah. Brad Whitbeck, they um, reviewed this uh, particular um, new venture here, the Mormon News Weekly Venture. I just want to play one clip for you where they uh, took a look at this. I mean, the Weekly Mormon News Venture was supposed to be, you know, people getting together, discussing the church news without animus, even if you bring different points of view. Mm -hmm. I just want to play one clip from the Midnight Mormons who they reviewed those episodes and just get your response. And then you go on to do a weekly news show with the biggest anti-Mormon out there, and you are essentially giving him credibility by doing that and not basically pushing back against him? Uh, what are you doing? Right, so, I mean, the Midnight Mormons are saying, hey, no one should be doing any type of uh, engagement with uh, so-called anti-Mormons like John DeLynn. You know, faithful people should only be talking to faithful people. You should never be trying to build a bridge. And whenever you encounter someone who has an opinion that is different from your own, you should be stridently and, and voraciously trying to defend your faith and um, set them straight. Yeah, there's just so much wrong there. First of all, Jana Reese, I'm a big fan. Patrick Mason, I'm a big fan. John DeLynn, I'm a big fan. I like diversity and I like a interesting civil conversation. So I don't know what's going on with their podcast. I would love to see that all happen. But as far as labeling, you know, John DeLynn is the worst anti-Mormon out there. And that's just vilifying people. That That is, I mean, it, 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 you know, for a church that professes to follow Jesus, uh, that's exactly the opposite of what Jesus would teach. Jesus sat down with the hookers and the drug addicts and the outcasts of society. I'm not saying that's what John DeLynn is. He's certainly not any of those things. But he sat down with people that he, you know, were considered the the, you know, outliers and had civil conversations with them and even befriended them. So to to vilify a person, whether it's John or anybody else, is this so out of bounds? Again, it goes to their credibility. It says more about them than it ever says about John. I, I know John. I've known him for years. He's a good guy. He's been through, and his family's been through hell, and they still keep going. And uh, I haven't caught John DeLynn in a single lie yet. And if he makes a mistake, he owns it. So that's all I can say about that. I well, really appreciate your perspective. Now, our next news article here is the Lori Vallow is uh, still, uh, the doomsday mom is still in court. Still, that trial is still going on. A uh, terrible tragedy there um, in Idaho. And I know that you are, um, you know, I, we have to be careful here because you do a lot of these court type of uh, situations as an expert witness. So mm -hmm. I'm not asking you at all for an expert, your expert opinion about this. I just wanted to get maybe if you had any personal reaction to this, this, this week of testimony, there's no, there's no cameras that are allowed in the court. And we did get the audio from uh, Lori's sister. So Lori's sister went and talked to her in jail. And um, she, it was a terribly, terribly emotional phone call. It's one of the most heart-wrenching phone calls where she confronts Lori and says, it looks like you killed your two children. Can you explain this to me? Because I've been the defender. I've been your best ally. Please, can you explain this to me? And the callousness of Lori Vallow was absolutely stunning. And um, she said, uh, the, her sister said, uh, Shiflet said, you know, my trust in Lori was broken. You threw Tylee in a pet cemetery like a piece of garbage. This is not Christ. Like there's nothing good in that, she said, during the uh, 2020 visit, which um, has just been unsealed. And the other thing I wanted, before I get your just a personal opinion, not a professional opinion on this. The other thing that came out is that um, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow, they went to... Um, 
um, LDS temples quite a few times throughout this entire thing. And the craziest thing is, is that the church had to release, you know, when you go into the temple, they swipe your temple recommend. The church keeps <laughs> that data. And that data was unsealed. And it turns out that the day before Tylee died, Lori and Chad, they this is the day prior to the children's death. They visited the Idaho Falls Temple according to the um according to the fbi and they visited um you know also around the time of, of tammy's death this is incredibly the irony here of going to the temple and then potentially allegedly committing this type of uh crime the next day is just it really take has taken me a lot back do you have any personal personal thoughts here on, on this trial and especially you know the role that religion appears to have played in the in, in the situation yeah, well, it's the most profoundly sad thing on planet Earth when a child is harmed in any way. I feel very, very passionately about that. You know, Sam Young's made that his cause. I think Sam has hit it on the head when it comes to every reasonable adult's agenda to protect every child. I I don't know that it's fair to the church to go too far and blame the church or, or tie religion in with it. These people are obviously whack jobs, that's my opinion. Um, who would harm a child. That, that's the most vile criminal thing a person could possibly do. I'm sure there's nobody in the church that would ever condone that or knowingly allow them into the temple, knowing that that's what they were up to. So I would probably say, you know, let's be fair to the church. I, I don't think anybody would, would condone that. And let's call it what it, what it is. These are two sociopathic criminals that, you know, um, are allegedly... Uh, involved with a homicide of a child and and let's keep focus on that and not not pull the church into something where i'm sure the rest of any reasonable person including members of the church would would have nothing but disdain for their behavior yeah and Pre president nelson in the previous general conference he said that the, the church has absolutely no tolerance for child abuse so that was uh, his public stand that there's no place for it that is horrific so yeah i mean this is just this, this this trial is just so horrible in so many ways. Uh, I guess maybe I'm just uh, maybe I'm not too scholarly of a person because I do um, I do want to follow it, and there's something inside of me that just wants to see what is going to happen with it all. And uh, I really just hope that the bottom line is that justice is served. Yeah, I, and I agree with you, and I, I'm glad that President Nelson said that. The problem is is that the instruction should be when there's even an allegation of these things, these are not things that should be handled by an untrained bishop call the police. They are trained to investigate these things. And these predators need to be weeded out and put in prison and jail where they belong. Absolutely. Now, our next article here. Now, this is a little bit of an old news here, but uh, the SEC fined that the church got fined and it's uh, an investment arm, Enzyme Peak Advisors. The church was fined a million and the Enzyme Peak Advisors was fined $4 million. This just took place a short time ago, maybe a month ago. But uh, And there's been a lot of talk about it. There's been a billions of electrons burned up about it. But the thing is, is that the Widows Might Report dropped their analysis of the SEC fine. And this is really, you can find all of this into our show notes, by the way. We link to all of these articles. This is on uh, widowsmightreport.wordpress.com back, uh, backslash SEC order. This is the best analysis in my opinion. And I've watched, I think all of them, I've read all of it and I've watched all of the episodes, whether it was on, uh, you know, Mormon stories, whether it was on Nemo's channel, whether we covered it ourselves, this is the best analysis. I think of the sec, if you want to get down to the brass tacks of it, I think you can find it here. The most amazing slide, there's a number of slides and we don't have enough time to go through. I'm just going to give you one highlight here, uh, Randy for the, the best slide in the entire slide deck is the Widows Might Report went back and looked at the civil penalties for people who violated the proper filing of the 13F forms, which is what the church really um, got in trouble for doing. The $5 million combined civil penalty that the church, that the SEC leveled on the church is 50 times larger than any other previous fine for violations of the Exchange Act Disclosures Law. Uh, uh, Section 13F violations are not common because the law is easy to understand and follow. It's something that uh, is really, really easy to understand and do. So if you look at the previous fines that have happened for people who failed to uh, invest, mostly investment groups here, didn't file the proper 13 Fs, uh, the fine for Cabot was uh, $12,000, Maggi was 12,000, Quattro was 100,000. So we're seeing 50 times difference the SEC level of fine. The SEC seems to be sending a clear message with this fine. Any thoughts on this, uh, Randy? Well, yeah, I mean, what the church did is so egregious and not only egregious, it went on for decades and decades. And it was such a deliberate attempt to set up uh, 12 or 13, whatever it was, shell companies and deliberately hide this money 
it it, it deserves a very large fine. And it's I think uh, this is really ironically no news at all. The the fine is gigantic for a good reason because what happened and what uh, you know uh, went down was just so hideous uh, economically and financially. Yeah, absolutely. And the, this particular widow's might report, it documents, it says that in those 13 F filings, that the church had 650,000 inaccuracies or errors in those filings, because you have to file those every single month. And the church did that for, I think it was 22 years. So because uh, it wasn't just that the amount was wrong, it's that the managers were wrong. It was that the, the um, all the disclosures were wrong. There was hundreds of thousands of conscious decisions that this uh, widow's might report brings out that the church really consciously you don't make 650,000 errors on your own um without a conscious decision and that's why the sec find them in a way that they have find no one else uh any any last thoughts on this Randy? yeah and, and and all that and i would just add that this is s systemic deceit this is a systemic problem it's widespread at the very top levels of the church you you, you don't pull off a fraud like this um, with one person. It takes a whole team to deliberately be, get on the same page to create a, a problem of this magnitude. And it's systemic and it's deceitful and it's, um, it, it's horrible. It's, it's anything but Christian, I can tell you that. Now, uh, our, our next article here, Randy, is uh, AI is all the rage these days. And if you go onto Reddit, somebody has uh, written a program for ChatGPT. And every single day, the ChatGPT bot, which they nicknamed the Moroni bot, it calls the web for uh, faith-promoting LDS news, and it puts it into Reddit. And every day, it pulls out about 20 articles of uh, faith-promoting news from other Razban going to Armenia to uh, Pew Research Center to... Uh, you know, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints holds the disaster preparedness play, uh, fair or a flunking sainthood blogs. It, it checks the blogs. It checks the church news. It checks Facebook. It checks everything. And you can get a complete, uh, a pretty good faith promoting a look of all of Mormon news just from this one AI chatbot every single day. And these articles, uh, the, the headlines and things with the links, it's all very professional. And uh, I guess the Mormon News Roundup is uh, a sinking even further into relevancy. Any thoughts on this? Well, I, I think that it's wonderful that they are scanning the news through a lens, through a biased lens that is faithful. I think people should read it. But, they, you know, if we're going to be intelligent, if we're going to be critical thinkers, we should look at the other side of the story as well. Looking, always looking at both sides of the story is what we want to do. Um, so, I, you know, but the other thing is when you really dig, dig into a lot of these things, they'll take very difficult problems and, and very difficult uh, uh, sticky points of the church. And they'll say, well, we really don't know what happened. We have a lot of questions and blah, 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 blah. Well, the fact is we do have questions, but we also have some answers and they skip really looking at those answers. So, you know, get both sides of the stories because there are some answers and they're not so comfortable for believing members. It, it, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. Now, you found this next article here uh, that you thought was very remarkable. And I guess in your neck of the woods, maybe um, maybe it, it has a lot of traction here. And this is the latest Mormon convert here who seems to have um, really has an out, out, outsized level of following. He seems to be really the darling, the, the, the biggest convert that the church has had in the last couple of months that I can recall here. Um, the, and his name is David Alexander, and he's an evangelical Christian who converted to Mormonism. You found this article, Randy. Why did you find interest in um, how, how newsworthy he is? Well, I've, I'm personally interested in this because, like I said uh, to the start, I am not so big on Joseph Smith, but I, I do like Jesus. And so this guy's an evangelical Christian. I, I have, a, honestly, a problem with some of the evangelical political agendas. But that aside, um, th this guy's kind of exploded. And really, I'm going to be watching this because... I'm going to be curious if he's going to engage, um, you know, uh, all sides of the story or if he's just going to go with the Mormon kind of mindset where we disregard and label and dismiss any, you know, contrary or critical views. That, that's the big question is yet to be seen with this guy.
Yeah, he really gained ascendancy by going on the Quick Media channel, uh, who has a very popular YouTube channel, has like 30,000 followers. And uh, David Alexander, he's based out of Australia. And um, if you look at the comments section in this, the amount of, of, you know, I've been in the church most of my life, and this this man, is he strengthens my testimony. Thank you, gentlemen. I love this video. He knows what he's talking about. Let's go. I relate to this so much. Thank you. Triple exclamation point. I'm glad you found this new convert. What a beautiful testimony. Fantastic conversation. I Look, you know, YouTube comment sections are usually places where there's a lot of vitriol, especially around religion. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of trolls. They uh, just the comment section. I don't think I've ever seen a YouTube comment section that is so overwhelmingly positive for one's person's religious um, religious conversion. Well, how can this be explained? I think it kind of goes back when I was on my mission in England, we had this, and, and you know about it, the 17 coins of the true church that came out. And that was all the rage back then. And I see kind of a repeat with uh, David Alexander and, and the church's narrative, I, I'll give full credit. It's a very slick narrative. It's a really wonderful story from A to Z. And, you know, uh, it's very appealing. I bought it for fif over 50 years. The problem is that uh, when you really dig behind that official narrative, there are really severe, insurmountable problems. So, yeah, I think he's riding that wave of the church's narrative, which of all people I wish were true. I genuinely do, but it's not. Um, and I think he's riding that wave of, of the church's official narrative, uh, but it's a correlated narrative and it's, it's whitewashed, but it is what it is. And some people really want to stick to it. I think a lot like what you said about the 17 true points, the, the, the purest Mormon convert that you can get is someone who has looked at every other faith. You know, David, he was born a Catholic. He turned out to be an evangelical, but he didn't stop there. He looked, if you watch his interviews, he looked at all of the religions. He just sat down. He wasn't finding, um, he wasn't finding connection in his evangelical church. So he said, you know what, I'm going to systematically look at every religion on earth, all theologies, all esotericologies. What can I find out there? And also compare it to the Bible. You know, what does the Bible teach me? And, and he, he looked at all of them and he settled on the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That is like the most, um, I don't know, members just love that story because I, it really reaffirms to them that, hey, you know, maybe I was born in the church. I didn't really have much of a choice to it. But other people who have searched their entire lives, have looked everywhere, are very, very smart. He's extremely articulate. He's very knowledgeable. Other people who have looked at this, they settled on the same thing that I have. And that really makes me feel good. It does make me feel good, too. I, I mean, I still, you know, I was just talking to RFM the other day about the 17 points, you know, thing. And it you read it and it feels great. And that's part of egos, logos, and pathos. But you also have to look at the logos and you have to look at the ethics, the ethos. And when you look at the whole picture and both sides of the story, I hate to say it, uh, it falls apart. Yeah, and he started his own YouTube channel here, and there he is with a great and spacious, uh, he's got the great and spacious building, he's got the covenant path. When you listen to him, it sounds like he's been a member forever. He's got all of the lingo down. He's got all of the latest stuff here. Uh, Grandma's wonderful covenant path testimony. We'll be re ruling our own planets. He's talking about priesthood here, and, uh, you know, he's really going viral, and... Um, you know, he's he's making the rounds in the LDS podcasting, LDS uh, YouTube circuit. He's uh, going to be the next big thing, I think, out there. He's kind of up upping, if you're familiar with Pastor Jeff McCullough and Hello Saints. He's kind of uh, taking that to the next level. Yeah, he has. And I'm going to actually, at some point, I'm going to reach out to him and see if he'll talk to somebody who has some some pretty pointed questions. I'm always polite. I'm, I'm never, I try not to be a jerk. Um but I have some questions for him that at some point I like to ask him and see what happens. I just noticed that you had the Master of Disaster hat on. I forgot. I didn't see that, so that's good. <laughs> uh, apparently, you're embracing it. Um, okay, now our next article here. Uh, our next article here, Randy, is this 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 devotional here of the the church historian here, uh, Elder McKay, who is a Journal Authority seventy. He's a lawyer. He was instituted as the church historian here just a few months ago, uh, about six months ago, I believe. And he gave a very um, a viral uh, BYU-Idaho devotional. It's about 30 minutes long here. And it's, the title of it is, In the Face of Doubts, Make Jesus Christ Your Foundation. Basically, this entire, uh, this entire 
devotional is about doubting your doubts. And it's what to do if you feel like your testimony is not as strong as it should be. And what to do if you see others leaving the church around you. And some of his talk has really gone viral. I want to play one portion of it for you, which was uh, put out here by RFM here. Um, and this is one of the most remarkable moments in the devotional. Is your testimony of Jesus Christ and his restored gospel strengthened by but not dependent on others? Is your foundation sure and certain enough that you can remain unshaken even if someone you admire in the faith makes a mistake now or in the future or in the past? Is your knowledge and testimony of truth strong enough that you can stare down compelling reasons to doubt and choose to believe. Have you learned the gospel, the principles of the gospel in such a way that you can do all this? Now, Randy, you did an entire episode on critical thinking. What's your reaction? Well, it's just like popcorn is going off and he's violating every single rule of critical thinking. I, I did that episode with RFM and John DeLynn on critical thinking. And if you go through... Critical thinking is more just a, a nice buzzword to make you sound smart. It, there's an actual process, and and that's all laid out, you know, in an hour or two with with John. But you know, the straw man's where he, you know, speaks for the critic and kind of, you know, paints a picture of what the critic would say, and then he beats that down. Well, that's a classic manipulative tactic, and you know, he's attributing these to critics of the church. Well, I'm a critic, and I would never say what he's attributed to me. That's that's not my point of view. Um, and then, you know, the, the, st the, the, the thought stopping, I mean, the thing that, you know, it's all emotion and ignore the facts. And he uses the word compelling, which as a lawyer, he should know better because that's a, that's a word judges use a lot that I find this testimony compelling. I don't find this testimony compelling. Um, you know, if you find something compelling and you choose to ignore it anyway, again, your a reasonable person's head would explode because that's just so contrary to how the world really works. Yeah. And the biggest thing for me is that he said that uh, there's, he literally acknowledged that there are compelling reasons not to believe in the church and its narrative, but are you strong enough to completely ignore those compelling reasons? That's, that's really, you know, it's one thing for me to believe in God and say, you know what, I don't have physical evidence for it. It's something that I feel in my heart. It's something that I can't prove to you, and it's something that is not verifiable with my five senses, you know, but I can still believe and I can still find value in it. It's another thing to say, well, I believe in some kind of a, a supreme being or some type of a construct where there's compelling reasons not to believe in it, but I should believe into it different. I should believe it anyway. That is really two different roads or, or two different bridges. Yeah, completely. You know, one, one group, uh, Biola University in L.A., they... They literally once a year they invite the, the you know, various atheists to the campus. They assemble the entire student body and they have a very polite, dignified debate between believers and non-believers in front of the entire student body. That's how real people operate in the real world that are really on a quest to find the truth. No longer do I say I know this, I know this, I know this. I say well. I believe this. I don't know about that. The most compelling evidence seems to lean on this side. That's the language that I use now in terms of, of religion, because I don't know anything. Uh, none of us really do, if we're honest. But, um, you know, what, what he's doing is he's shutting all that down. It would be as if the Mormon church invited you and John DeLynn and Bill Real and RFM and Sam Young to the Marriott Center and had all of BYU come out and have a, a, a friendly cordial debate debate between the quorum of the 12 and and these folks but that will never happen because the church wants to shut down any conversation because they just don't like where that goes and that's a really big red flag let me play another clip for you here randy and get your thoughts on this next section you can't hide or hide from the humanness of humans but it is equally unproductive to seek out error and wallow in it by making it an emphasis of study. You will never come to know and understand the truths of God by studying the errors of man. 
Okay, now remember, we're in a university setting here where we're really, you know, I taught at BYU for a lot of years. You know, the purpose of a university is to really to have critical thought and examinations and have divergent points of view where you come, you know, you study it. Maybe you have your opinion, I have mine, but we study, we find what have other people said about this. And and what he does in this clip is he said, you know, you know, you, you shouldn't be fact checking. You shouldn't use your um, intelligence. You shouldn't use reason to um, solve any of your gospel challenges. Yeah, well said. And let me just say, he he said, do not scrutinize or fact check church leaders or church history. You should just, you know, nor, nor see if those teachings are lining up with what is in the standard works. Remember, that is what the standard works were supposed to be for, uh, supposed to be for. They're standard. So you compare what we are hearing now with what is in the standard works, and they supposedly should be lining up. He says, no, don't do any of that. Don't scrutinize. Don't fact check. Don't research. Don't do any of those things. Yeah, and not only that, he labels these things as mistakes and errors. You know, as, as a critic of the church, I don't care. I make mistakes daily and errors and, you know, blunders. Uh, that, that's not the issue. Well, you know, Joseph Smith was human. I get that. But, you know, to be telling the church and the public that, hey, I have one wife, her name is Emma, at the same time he's saying that, he's got 30, you know, secret wives, and there weren't wives. These were affairs. Let's call them what they were. These were not legal marriages, so they were affairs. Um, with with other men's wives and with children who are 14 who don't, children cannot give consent. There was no consensual relationship there because legally they can't give consent. That's child molestation. This is a sexual predator. That Those are, you, you don't take a sexual predator's behavior and call it a mistake or an error. That That is such an, a gross understatement of the real issues we're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, I'll read a couple of other sections here. We don't have enough time to go through the entire talk, but he said, having perplexing questions from reasons to doubt is not a problem. But please understand, finding answers to these perplexing questions ultimately is not the solution. So finding the answers to those type of things, you're, you're bringing up a very perplexing situation, which is where we have Joseph Smith seemingly doing one thing and saying another thing. But he says, no, don't understand. Finding answers, answering that, that's not the solution. The solution is just to really keep sweet, pray, and obey. Don't research too much. Don't fact check. Don't look at your history. And again, this is coming from the church historian. Yeah, and the church historian certainly does not want you looking at Joseph Smith too carefully. The problem is, is that the entire credibility of the Mormon church rests on the credibility of Joseph Smith. And, you know, it's not mistakes and errors and, and even a banking scandal. I mean, those are, you know, as big as that is, that, that's not going to take it down. But these are such fundamental, um, egregious crimes that we're talking about. And not only that, crimes against children. Um, sorry, I'm not buying into that. Those, that's not my value system. Can't do it. Yeah, the other thing he says in the devotional, just one last point, is that prophets, they aren't perfect. And of course, he cites biblical prophets. You know, Peter cut off an ear. Uh, David, he uh, killed Uriah and slept with Bathsheba. The church is very comfortable pointing to prophetic fallibility in the scriptures, especially the Bible. But he does not turn that lens. There's no prophetic, uh, he says, you know, there's no errors that he points out in the last 200 years, and especially not with Joseph Smith, and heavens no, not with the current leadership. Well, yeah, and you can find all kinds of examples in the Bible. P you know, Peter himself denied the Christ. But you know what? They made a mistake, and they well, a mistake. They made egregious mistakes, and they owned it. They admitted it. They documented it. The church does the exact opposite. They whitewash and pretend it never happened. If the church would come clean, and and the church would call it the way it is, uh, without these whitewashed uh, gospel topic uh, narratives and everything that that try and dismiss and understate everything. Um, you know, I would, you know, uh, I don't know if I'd ever go back or not, but, but it would have some level of respect right now as, as long as they keep whitewashing things, you can't compare that to the Bible where they don't whitewash it. They own it. Right. And again, the, the solution that Elder McKay puts out for us is if you have a doubt, if you have something in church history or doctrine or theology that you are having troubles with, that you're having a problem with. The only solution that he proffers is just to pray about it 
and that God will confirm to you that the church is true and that Russell M. Nelson is the prophet. And anything else that you do is counterproductive. It really makes me wonder why we have a history department to begin with, since it basically makes his job out to be absolutely. Why do we have a historian anyway if we can't even if you're not even supposed to look at the church history or do any quote unquote fact checking or any scientific or don't scientifically research, don't historically research, don't even don't even compare current teachings with the standard works. Don't think about these things too deeply. Just pray to God and he will confirm to you that you're on the covenant path and to stay in the church. Yeah, and I hate to say this, but it's the truth. Uh, one of the cases I worked on was the Heaven's Gate cult, which is the cult of cults. And I got all the police videos when I worked on that case. And the and Doe, who ran, who ran the uh, whole cult thing, uh, was he said the same thing. Just pray about it. Uh, don't ask anybody. Don't talk to your friends or neighbors. You're not going to get anything out of them. Just go in your closet. That's the term he used and pray about it and ask God directly. You know what? I'm all for prayer. I really am. But prayer should be coupled with is asking simple questions. Is this ethical and is this logical? And have I looked at both sides of the story? And prayer can be part of the mix. But to make it the only part is literally the exact same tactic as the Heaven's Gate cult. Wow. That's wow. That's incredible. Okay, our next article here, uh, this has really gone viral here, Randy, and this was a, a senior, a missionary couple here who uh, went on a mission to um, uh, the, the Huffs. They left their new home in Draper, Utah uh, for 26 months ago. Now, this was an article that took place um, uh, several years ago, back in 2000, but it has really gone viral. Um, they lived in an isolated aluminum siding home miles from the nearest human inhabited in the southwest shore of Utah Lake. They were working 18 hours a day, particularly during the hunting and planting seasons. Um, their retired peers were greatly wondering why it is that they were volunteering at this preserve. Now, the preserve is called the Westlake Farm Commercial Hunting Area, and it is managed by the church. It's an exclusive club that is for members only. And in the article, Brother Huff here, he admits he was reluctant to take on such a momentous task. And he said, quote, it has been tough on me and my wife, end quote. Now, the preserve is designed to produce revenue for the church. Uh, hunting on the preserve is very, very expensive. Only the most well-to-do Mormons really can afford it. It's $1,500. And again, this was 20 years ago. So it's more like three, $5,000 just to go out there and hunt. And the craziest part about this article for me is that Elder Huff admits at the end of the article that uh, the hunting preserve, it didn't even turn a profit that year, but he was optimistic that it would turn a profit in the future. Now, the biggest question that I have for you, Randy, is, is this exploitation? Are, are the Huffs here being exploited by the church? Because that's what a lot of, uh, I call them anti-Mormons, call them critics, whatever you want to say. After this went viral, people are saying, are, are, they, being, uh, are they being exploited? Well, you know, I don't know the case well enough to say in this case, but I can tell you, generally speaking, uh, the church, I mean, it, it, a normal family, and I raised four kids, you're lucky to have 10% of your income after you pay all the bills, and to have that then go to, to tithing, and I like tithing, I still pay tithing, but, but not the way the church teaches it, I just look for causes and I try and help out where I can, but uh, to take the discretionary money, and then in this case, we're talking about discretionary time, particularly people that are older and, and retired, and, and taking them away from their families and away from their grandkids. My own parents, I love my parents. Uh, my mom's 100, and she's still with us, and I love them. But they went on four missions right during critical years with the grandkids. Uh, that, that didn't do any favors for, for my kids or, or for the family, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, taking sucking out the discretionary money and the and the discretionary time for volunteer work, um, you got to really take a careful look at that and ask yourself: Is that really a healthy family dynamic? Yeah, I, I do wonder here. I, I really think that this could be a faith promoting story if one of the following two criteria were met. Number one, if the preserve was turning a profit and the funds from that uh, preserve, if the profits were being used to clothe the neck, naked, to you know feed the hungry, to house the shelterless. Um, then this could be a faith promoting story. They dedicated their time to church. They earned a profit. And with that money, we fed people, we clothed people. There was naked people. We gave medicine, whatever it is. That to me is a faith promoting story. But given the opaqueness of the church's finances, uh, it, it would be hard to even know. And that's if it was profitable. What ended up happening is they, they served for 26 months. They lost money in the endeavor. How does one feel good about missionary service when you're supposed to be in a commercial for profit um, environment and you didn't even make any money. 
Yeah, it makes no sense. And it's really kind of frustrating because the church has uh, three of the four elements to really change the world. It has tons of money, uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars in liquid assets. It's got wonderful people with good hearts, you know, people that are still in the church, the three or four million people that are still in, in large part, are really wonderful people. So it's got that. And it also has a very, very impressive real estate portfolio, particularly around the country and, and around the world for staging events. What is lacking in, in terms of uh, really doing something is a heart, a heart to, to clothe the naked and to feed the hungry and to do the things that Jesus actually talked about. It doesn't have the heart to do that. And that's really heartbreaking in and of itself, because if you really take what Jesus said seriously, uh, you're going to have to find an outlet to do that kind of thing outside of the Mormon church. Yeah. Also think about this, uh, Randy. You know, we know Enzyme Peak from David Nielsen was founded in 1997. And according to him, it has $7 billion when it was first seeded. So we're in 2000. So say we've got $10 billion in the bank. So the church already has plenty of money at this time to either hire the Huffs or anyone else to run this preserve for that matter. Yeah. Now, now it, it would be also another thing. Let's say that you were volunteering on a farm and the farm didn't turn a profit, but your food again was being donated or you were, I don't know, you were running a soup kitchen and you lost money. That everything doesn't have to be about making money. The fact that the preserve lost money, that that's not a big deal. If what if the people who were coming on the preserve, their lives were being blessed in some manner, that's that that's something I can be proud of. The problem is, is that the people who are coming onto the preserve are uber wealthy Mormons who are literally hunting down defenseless animals, many of which uh, they're not even going to eat. Many times they just leave them and they're disposed of. This, that's why this story in particular, people are saying, you know, this is what the service, you know, the church has 60,000 current um, regular missionaries and about 30,000 service missionaries. Are This is what the service missionaries are doing in the church? That is a big shock for people, especially considering how much money the church even had back in 2000 at this time. Yeah, it comes down to do you really have a heart when you're doing this kind of stuff? I'm not a hunter, but I don't, I'm not critical of those who are uh, at all, but um yeah, the whole thing is is a mess. I agree with you. And this also comes in light. Let me play this last clip for you. And this is just a couple of weeks ago. I, I think it was a couple of months ago. And we had advice here that was given by um, it, it was given by our uh, excerpt from uh, Utah area president Kevin W. Pearson back uh, just just a couple of weeks ago that talks about senior missions. So he held a conference in Utah County, which is one of the biggest strongholds of senior missionary pool that the church can pull from. And it says, you know, let me just play the clip for you and get your reaction. Yeah. Yeah. We've invited you here tonight because we want to extend an invitation to each of you to serve. This is your, this is our box B speaking to you tonight. Will you prayerfully consider serving two missions? Not one, but two. A full-time proselyting mission, if your health permits, and a service mission here in Utah as well. The sequence is not important, but the call to serve is crucial. Your, your parents followed that, that call of serving more than one mission. Um, and how did that affect your family? Well, it, not in any positive ways in my point of view. I mean, you know, the Bell family, the Bells go right back to Nauvoo, and we're very proud of our pioneer heritage. And, and there was a father to son, you know, everybody went on a mission uh, you know, from Nauvoo to my son's going on missions. Um, and so on one hand, I'm proud of my sons and I'm proud of myself. I'm my dad and granddad and great granddad and all the way back um, that they had the hearts of service. It's just that I don't know that we really knew what we were serving. And, you know, it has the name of Jesus on there. And that's that's to me wonderful. But in terms of the actual organization, you got to ask yourself, is this really what Jesus would do? Because his agenda was all about helping the society's disadvantaged. And I didn't see that really happening. And I don't see that happening with what's going on here. Yeah, I wonder, think about the Huffs. If Jesus was around, would he volunteer 26 months of his life in a hunting preserve in an effort to generate money? But no, it actually lost money so that uber rich Mormons could come and hunt um, and hunt animals. Is that really how he would be spending his time when uh, if he if he were around now or upon his second coming? Is that really what he would want to be doing? 
Yeah, I think I know the answer to that. <laughs> That's it's easy. I, I I pray not. Now our next article here, uh, Randy, is a uh, uh, this is a real bombshell here, and it's actually kind of a clickbait. Two point three billion dollars awarded in sex abuse lawsuit that named the Mormon Church. What two billion dollar lawsuit of uh, sex abuse? This is absolutely a thunderbolt here, um, and it was written by the AP staff. We don't have a name on it, but this is a woman who was molested for years by her stepfather, has been awarded over $2 billion by a California jury in a lawsuit that also implicated her mother and the local Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um, in which both parents were active, her attorneys announced. So um, I know you reviewed this, Randy. What's going on with this case? Well, I, I think that it is clickbait was had liability and payouts but i don't think it was the whole 2.3 billion dollar number that's an enormous number of course that's going to be appealed in the court system but i can tell you in my own work that you know when when juries are fired up about something egregious they do go into some hundred million you know billion dollar type verdicts this is an astronomical amount of money and clearly what went down there uh really upset people that looked at the evidence Yep. And you also brought this up here. And this was uh this was just from yesterday, two point three billion dollars B with a B billion dollars awarded in sex abuse lawsuit that named the Mormon Church. This is kind of a clickbait um title though, because that, that wasn't all from the church itself. Yeah, it was a clickbait title, but the reality is yet yet again, the church is tied into child abuse and cover-ups, and I can tell you. When you get into child abuse and any mistreatment of a child, the news, the ratings, the the anger, the uh, the anxiety, the emotions go sky high. And, I, you know, the church has committed two hundred and fifty million dollars worth of uh, liability in in child abuse. That's a, that's just a fact. That is a mathematical fact. And people just won't look at that and say, what's going on here? Well, I do have a little bit of news on that $250 million figure, Randy, that maybe that uh, since I follow the news very carefully. Um, so the, that, you're talking about the Boy Scout sex abuse. Yeah. But the thing is, is that the judge threw out that uh, $250 million and they said that that would not be sufficient because the church kicked in $250 million, plus the church's insurer kicked in about $700 million. The church brought a billion dollars to the table. The problem here, and we see it from this particular article, is if you're severely abused in these situations, it can be one, even two million dollars a piece, as you as you well know. OK, so if you have 80,000 people, if they're getting severe abuse, it, it could be astronomical. That's why the judge, when the Boy Scouts went into bankruptcy, they said, we're not going to accept the church's portion of this as sufficient. And they threw that portion out. So when the Boy Scouts emerged out of bankruptcy, actually just last week and started to pay out the sexual abuse cases, the Mormon Church or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, their portion was not included with those class actions because they didn't bring enough money to the table. So the church is still really on the line here. So, yeah, when, when it first came out, I said, Randy, that $250 million, the church is finally doing the right thing. They're, they're putting a lot, uh, actually, with the church's insurer, a billion dollars to the table. That's kudos to the church. They're bringing a lot of money. No, that's totally insufficient, and it was a complete low ball. Yeah, you're right. And the other thing is in the core system, a verdict over 10 million is a big deal. That that will you know open people's eyes. When we're getting into the stratospheric numbers of hundreds of millions of dollars, which is the admitted part. The, the actual amount is yet to come. But your point's well taken. But we can I think we can uh, agree 250 million is what the church is willing to pay, but it's not enough. When we're talking about numbers of that magnitude with a relatively very, very small church, the problem is systemic. It's gigantic, and uh, you know, you do the you do the math comparing the Catholic Church to the Mormon Church on a per capita basis. My math, and it could be wrong, but my math shows that the Mormon Church is about five times more dangerous than the Catholic Church when it comes to these child molestation issues. And uh, whatever the math is, it's a gigantic problem. Yeah, and so this particular case, even though the headline said two point three billion, the church itself was—I'll say only, but still—a million dollar fine for a sex abuse case is is a significant fine, and um, you know it's, it's really tragic. What's also important about this article here is it says, um, I'm, "Let me quote from the article: The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints failed to report the abuse to law enforcement in violation of the law and used not just that, 
because that's happened many times before that. Unfortunately, we've come to know that that is par for the course, but they used intimidation and shaming tactics. That's a quote from the article to keep the victim from telling one anyone outside the church. So it's not a it's not this is a particularly horrific case where not only did you not report it to law enforcement, then you told the victim not to uh, report it to law enforcement. This is a really, really troubling case. It is profoundly troubling because what parent, what adult, what leader who has any sense of ethics and it involves the destruction of a child's emotions through these sexual abuse things would not pick up the phone and call the authorities, call the police and report it. To keep that secret and, and, to, and to victim shame and to victim blame and to put pressure on the victim, that's the last person that should be uh, re-victimized, essentially, uh, they should be protected. It, it, it's just beyond common sense. And again, my head wants to explode. I do find it remarkable that this is an AP uh, uh, sex abuse story that was not brought to us by Michael Resendez, who has been the crusader. He did Spotlight, of course, and then he's done a number of unflattering articles against the church. This was a staff article, so it was not brought to us by Michael Resendez. I do find that to be somewhat remarkable because I, I thought that he would be um, at the forefront of it. Uh, of a, I mean, obviously, I don't have any insider information. Any mm -hmm. last thoughts on this one, Randy? No, but uh, just watch out because hopefully the church will start paying out enough billions of dollars in the in the liability that they have with these child abuse cases, where they'll wake up and and create an organiz an organization that's actually safe for kids. The way a, a real church works is all the walls in the Sunday schools are glass. Uh, every single person that comes in touch with the children, and I mean that uh, metaphorically, that, that has contact or or dialogue with a child. Um, there's a criminal background check 100% of the time annually, not just a one-time check. I mean, there's protocols that normal churches use that are just totally ignored by the Mormon church. And, and we're now seeing the fallout from it. So hopefully this will wake things up. Yeah, in particular in California, it was just last year that California did not require background checks for um, clergy and other people who worked with youth just until this last year. And as soon as California passed the legislature, um, a, a bill, it was called a live scan bill. I forget the number of it. As soon as they said, OK, all churches, all, anyone, charities, anyone who works with children in any capacity will need to perform a background check. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints immediately sent out memos to all of its congregations saying, we need to participate in this live scan and everyone's going to need to get on board. Um, it would be nice to have that happen, not only in states that required it, obviously, but all states and all countries throughout the entire world. Yeah. And, you know, I'm from California and it is a wacky state, but they got that one right. And I'm, I'm happy about that. Now, our next article here, or, or I guess it's not an article, but it's a tweet here. The B.H. Roberts Foundation here, Randy, has unveiled an LDS GPT chatbot. Yeah, you heard that right. It's an AI apologist with a faith promoting bias. And it's backed by materials of uh, Fair Mormon and other websites. And you can go ahead and ask it your toughest gospel questions. And this is what the prompt looks like right now. It's uh, it's currently um, being developed. It's under development. But people, when it's not being developed, they've gone in. They've asked it the most important, uh, some some difficult gospel questions. And uh, for instance, you can ask it, why did Joseph Smith marry the Partridge sisters twice? And of course, the real answer is that he was, uh, you know, keeping it from Emma as a, as a, you know, he kept it from Emma as a part of a deception. And then he basically had a sham second marriage so that Emma would think that she was involved with the marriage. That's the real answer. But the chatbot, it says, oh, no, well, it's unclear. We don't know why he did it. It's possible that, uh, you know, he wanted to keep Emma involved, but we may never fully understand. And of course, there's many unique situations and it's a complicated issue. So we're get, so it, imagine I've got two kids in seminary right now. You have a seminary teacher who maybe doesn't know all of gospel history and has you know difficulties. It says, okay, well, I'm going to send you over to this chat, Bob. You can ask it your tough gospel questions, and you're going to get faith-promoting answers. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I, I think if you want faith-promoting answers, you know, go for it and read the stuff. But kids today, I'm not one of these old guys that thinks that kids are... Uh, you know, the, the messed up generation. I think they're frankly smarter than us and they're smart enough to read that and say, okay, what's the other side of the story? And go look at that and, and look at something that's biased against the church and then look at something that is uh, middle ground. I consider myself middle ground. I'm not biased one way or the other. I, I guess I'm, I have a bias for looking for the truth, but um, 
But anyway, I uh, I think it's interesting, but uh, but it also it clearly smacks of some man manipulation of our kids here. If that's the only thing they look at. Yeah, AI is all over the news these days. It's curating, promoting stories. It's answering your most difficult gospel questions. It's um, you know, AI is uh, is on the next wave pretty soon. They're going to be replacing uh, seedless podcast podcasters like myself. But I don't think, uh, Randy, I think you're safe. I don't think the AI is going to be replacing the master of disaster anytime soon. <laughs> I, you know, I pray for rule peace, but in the meantime, my job's pretty secure. <laughs> it's been a pleasure having you. Uh, it's been a pleasure going through the news and keep up the great work. Okay, well, shout out to Weird Alma for this uh, episode's music. And remember, remember, no unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. So long. <laughs>